Come on. Fly up. Looks like I'm not very successful in making photon rockets. Hmm. Here is the question. Imagine a flashlight in space far from massive bodies. If we turn it on, would it start moving? If we want to be able to travel from one star to another, we gotta go fast. So what's the fastest thing? Light. So I have light, I have an engine. Fast spacecraft. I wish it was that simple. But two of my previous videos were about two hypothetical drives. M drive, which is impossible in principle, and warp drive, that is technically is not forbidden by laws of physics, but it's hard to say if it is ever going to be created. So in previous videos I talked about hypothetical drives. How about we talk about something a bit more realistic, something that at least doesn't either violate laws of physics or require some new principles. Something that technically can be done. I'm talking about photon engines, using light for propulsion of spacecraft. How to use light to travel in space? What types of photon engines could there be? There are a couple of ways to use light to move an object. How realistic this is? What issues need to be solved? And could we actually build a photon rocket? Let's talk about all this and more. My name is Andre, and this is Cosmos Elementary. What exactly do I mean by a photon engine? Well, we use light to move a spacecraft. But I'm not talking about using light to generate electricity to power the electric field that accelerates ionized gas particles and those particles create thrust, as it is the case with ion drives. No, I'm talking about directly using momentum of light to make an object move. Many of you probably immediately think about the light sail. And I'll touch on that as well, but not only that. Let's get back to the question of a flashlight in space. Would it create thrust if we turned it on? Yes, but a really, really weak thrust. Still, light has momentum, and in a way, because photons come from one side of a flashlight, it is reminiscent of a rocket engine. But again, that kind of thrust is super weak. In a video on M-Drive, I said this. Actually, we could have some really weak thrust if we removed this plate, so photons could escape the system. But that would be a photon drive, which is a story for another time. And what if it's not a bucket with a microwave attached to it, but let's say a super powerful laser? There can be two main options. We either propel a spacecraft by using radiators installed on the spacecraft itself, or use photons coming from somewhere else, like in the case of a light sail. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First, we need to talk about the momentum of light. I already talked about the momentum of light in my recent videos on the black hole made of light and also M-Drive. But let me quickly go through basic ideas and I'll also bring some new examples. So momentum is basically the measure of quantity of motion and it is equal to mass times velocity. And it's an important thing for all kinds of means of transport. One body can transfer momentum to another body. Air molecules that are moving with the wind transfer momentum to a sail which makes a boat move. Another way is when momentum escapes the system. Newton's third law, action and reaction. I showed how it works like this and it is similar to how rocket engines work. Gas that has momentum escapes the system from one side and the rocket is moving in the opposite direction. But some might say, gas in a rocket, air, some weights, all of that has mass and so obviously it has momentum when it's moving. But photons, aren't they massless? Well, yes, they are. But perhaps no one will argue that they also have energy. After all, we use it every day and basically exist because of it. In that video I showed some equations, now I won't go into that. I'll just say that light has energy and momentum, and not only in equations but also in practice. Perhaps some of you could have seen some effects of the momentum of light with your own eyes. Comets. Last year, Comet C2020 F3 Neo Wise was a huge deal for everyone who is interested in astronomy. It was even visible with the naked eye. I myself observed it multiple times and even took pictures. These are my photos, by the way. So if you've seen that or other comet, it means you witnessed the proof that light has momentum and it can make objects move. What am I talking about? At a certain distance from the sun, comet tails form. A dust tail, 
a gas tail or iron tail. And also there is a more rare third type of a sodium tail. As perhaps many of you know, tails are pointing away from the sun and it doesn't matter which direction the comet itself is moving. Iron tail is mostly affected by the charged particles of the solar wind, but the dust tail is influenced by the pressure of solar radiation. Photons transfer momentum to dust particles, and if those particles are small enough and mass is low, this transferred momentum can win over the gravitational attraction of the Sun, and thus such a elongated tail in the opposite direction is formed. In this case, light acts a little like wind, basically blowing away dust particles and we can see the effect of radiation pressure with our own eyes. And that's not the only example. There is special equipment that uses lasers to cool down samples. In some cases, due to transfer of momentum, it allows to slow down atoms, and that is cooling the sample. Also, scientists use such tools as optical traps or tweezers, where laser light is used to trap and manipulate macroscopic objects. Also, the pressure of light is accounted for in calculating spacecraft trajectories. For instance, if it hadn't been accounted for, Viking spacecraft would have missed the orbit of Mars by 15,000 kilometers. So light has momentum, it can create pressure, you can see it, and it is actively used and accounted for. If the momentum of a massive body depends on mass and velocity, with light it's a bit different. Light doesn't have mass, and its speed is the same for any frame of reference. So the momentum of light depends on wavelength. Here is the equation where momentum equals Planck constant divided by the wavelength. Knowing that, we can infer that because the Planck constant is really, really small, the momentum of an individual photon is really weak. That's why we don't get knocked down to the floor every time we turn on the light. And also we can see that the shorter the wavelength, the higher the momentum, which means that higher energy photons like X-ray or gamma radiation have higher momentum. We can actually use light to make an object move, but because the momentum of individual photons is weak, we need a lot of light, preferably the higher energy light. Okay, okay, we get it. Light has momentum, which means, in theory, we can make a spacecraft move by releasing photons from one side, which would be a photon rocket. The main goal here is to accelerate the spacecraft to a significant fraction of the speed of light, let's say 10%. To make travel to the nearest stars at least somewhat viable, about a hundred years instead of tens of thousands. But how effective would this method be? Basically, we need some energy source to generate radiation powerful enough to focus it in a way to be able to propel a spacecraft. For example, there is an idea of a nuclear photon rocket. In the process of nuclear reactions, fuel is used and it creates radiation. They can be both fission and fusion reactions. But because so far we haven't yet created efficient fusion reactors, let's look at fission. And here is the problem. One of the biggest issues of modern chemical rockets is that it takes a lot of fuel to launch them. Most of the rocket's mass is fuel. The same would be true for nuclear photon rockets. I have found some estimates, and in this paper it is claimed that for a rocket of dry mass of 10 tons, mass without fuel, to accelerate to 1% of the speed of light, you would need 300,000 tons of nuclear fuel for a 10-ton rocket. To achieve 10% of the speed of light, well, that would require 10 to the 45 tons of fuel. In a different paper, I found this table and it says that maximum speed achievable by a photon rocket with generators on board using both fission and fusion. In the first case, it is 5 100 thousandth of the speed of flight. In the case of fusion, it is a bit better, 2 10 thousandth, which is 60 kilometers per second. That's only four times the velocity of Voyager 2. Based on this info, so far we can conclude that onboard generators don't seem to be very effective. But also, there is antimatter. As you may know, when a particle collides with its antiparticle counterpart, they annihilate. Mass is converted into energy and a lot of radiation is emitted. This option is good because of high conversion rate of mass into radiation. For instance, in the case of electron-positron annihilation, gamma photons are emitted, and those have high energy, thus momentum. Also, using antimatter, we would need a lot less fuel. But the disadvantage is that it's not easy to deal with gamma radiation. 
The big question is to how to effectively focus this much of gamma radiation, especially as long as it goes through a lot of materials. To stop it, you need some thick protection. Also, it could hit up to tens of thousands of degrees, which is kind of a problem. But most importantly, if we even consider using antimatter, yes, it can be created now, but in such small amounts that right now it is not a very viable option to use it in this way. In this case, we are lacking required tech to work with antimatter and the antimatter itself, though it is possible in principle. To sum up, so far emitting radiation from a spacecraft itself to make it move doesn't seem to be a good option, at least for now. But there is another way. Today, placing the source of radiation not on the spacecraft itself, but rather externally, is considered to be a better option. This way, you don't need to carry a whole bunch of fuel. I've mentioned the light sail a couple of times, so first let's touch on that. The idea is not that complicated. Make a special kind of sail, attach it to a spacecraft, solar light would transfer momentum to the sail and make the spacecraft move. The velocity we could achieve this way depends on several factors. How light is the material of a sail, how well it reflects the light, how large the sail is and so on. And obviously the mass of a spacecraft is also important. But in this case we don't have to have this much fuel on board. And most importantly, this technology has already been successfully tested in space. To first successfully demonstrate this effect was Japanese spacecraft Icarus. In 2010 it deployed a solar sail 14 by 14 meters or 46 feet and it produced measurable acceleration. Right now in orbit there is light sail 2 spacecraft and it too successfully demonstrates solar sail thrust. Though the sail is smaller, it is 5.6 by 5.6 meters or 18 feet. The acceleration is very small, only 0.058 millimeters per second squared. An amount of constant sunlight, it achieves the speed of 549 km per hour. Doesn't look very impressive, but that's not the goal. The goal is to show that technology works. And it does. Obviously, to be able to actually use light sails for even interplanetary travel, we need to improve the technology. Make it thinner, lighter, more effective, and at the same time, way bigger. It should have an area of square kilometers instead of square meters or feet. But there is another problem. The distance. The farther from the sun, the weaker the radiation. According to the inverse square law, the intensity of radiation is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. If y twice as far, the signal is 4 times weaker, 10 times farther, signal is 100 times weaker and so on. And here we can use the help of lasers. Oh, by the way, while I was looking for information for this video, I stumbled upon an interesting concept. It is also a type of a drive that involves light, lasers specifically, but still it's different. It's called lightcraft, and it's not about radiation pressure. This is what some tests look like. Looks a little like a flying saucer. The laser is on the ground and it shines up at the craft. The craft is also spun up to increase stability. The light inside is reflected, it warms the air up and the air transforms into plasma. And that creates thrust. During tests, they managed to actually make it fly up. Obviously, this way it can work only in the atmosphere. In theory, this way we could put a spacecraft into orbit, but in space it would still require fuel. The story is different, but still interesting. But there is one more approach. Beamed laser propulsion. As we figured out, emitting photons from a spacecraft itself requires a lot of fuel or unavailable amounts of antimatter. The problem of a solar sail is not so powerful radiation of the sun. But if we build a super powerful laser that focuses at a reflector on the spacecraft, we wouldn't need to take all that fuel and the radiation is more powerful and focused. Some people believe this option to be among the most realistic ways to travel to the nearest stars, because it doesn't require anything fundamentally new. Rather, scaling up of the existing technologies or principles. The idea itself is not that new. For instance, it is in this 1984 paper by Robert Forward. He writes about several options, one of which is an Alpha Centauri flyby mission. According to Forward, it would require Well, a 7.2 terawatt laser array. So it would require the power generated by 320 of the most powerful modern power plants, like the Three Gorges Dam in China. 
To focus the beam, you'd need a lens of 1000 kilometers or 620 miles in diameter. So a 785 ton spacecraft would need a light sail of 100 kilometers in diameter. According to Forward, it would be able to accelerate up to 21% of the speed of light and reach Alpha Centauri only in 40 years. 40 years is basically nothing. It is how long Voyagers have been in space. We would need 320 of the most powerful power plants? Well, we've built one. Well, of course, actually way more, but anyway. We would build 320. A thousand kilometer lens? Well, not easy, but doesn't violate laws of physics. Of course, it is more nuanced than that, but perhaps that could be easier than making lots of antimatter or warping space-time. Also, Forward describes a way to slow down at a star and not just simply fly by it, and even a possibility to return back home. To achieve this, the sail consists of several segments. At the deceleration stage, a part of it, in the form of a ring, gets detached and it reflects light back to a remaining segment. And that should slow a spacecraft down. Forward calculated that you could stop a spacecraft this way and even send it back using the same laser and stop it here in our system. For that, you would need a thousand kilometer sail for a trip to Epsilon, Eridini and back. Also, if you wanted to put people on such a spacecraft, the mass becomes orders of magnitude higher, as well as the required power of lasers. All right, but that's not the newest data. Is there anything more recent? Actually, there is. Studies of Yang Bei. He conducted experiments that demonstrated radiation pressure of lasers. Also in his articles, he wrote that you could make the technology more effective by implementing additional mirrors at the radiator to reflect back already used photons and use them again even at lower energies. This was also shown to work in experiments. Even Robert Forward's calculations for a return mission of a 3,000-ton spacecraft and a 100-kilometer sail, you would need a 17,000-terawatt laser. According to Yang Bei, using his idea, for a 800-ton spacecraft and a 40 meters, not kilometers, mirror, only a 10-terawatt laser would be enough. He also suggested that this technology should be implemented in phases. First, we need to start using BPL on satellites near Earth then use it to travel to the moon, then for interplanetary travel, and only after that go interstellar. But so far, unfortunately, there are no specific plans or projects here. But there is something else. You might have heard about Breakthrough Starshot. The project made headlines in 2016 when it was announced, and one of the main reasons for that was involvement of Stephen Hawking and other respectable scientists and engineers. Starship, a centimeter-sized interstellar spacecraft. It is planned to have some basic instruments for communication, a processor and a camera, and a small solar sail. There could be a thousand of those little spacecraft to increase the chance of them reaching the destination. They would be accelerated with gigawatt lasers and, according to people involved in the project, should be able to accelerate to 20% of the speed of light and achieve Proxima Centauri in 20 years. The project has been criticized by many, and even their own website has a list of the problems that still need to be solved. The main goal is to show that it is possible in principle to reach the nearest star relatively quickly. At least this project has some funding of 100 million dollars. We will see how it works out. Yes, so far interstellar travel using some form of photon engines is far from becoming the reality. And yet it could help us achieve speeds of 10, 20 and even 50% of the speed of light. That's perhaps one of the best options to make interstellar travel possible. You don't need exotic matter or break laws of physics. All of the principles are already known and we just need to solve some technological problems, scale the existing technology up. But still, this is not complete science fiction, which means someday we might be able to visit other stars. Thanks for watching. Links to all of the sources are as usual down below in the description. And if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment and subscribe. Bye.